of all the great things that are happening with Union Co-ops UK, the UK Cooperative College, and Preston Cooperative Development Network. This is quite a mighty team, and we are very happy and proud to have been collaborating together for a number of years now. Uh, I'm the moderator. Uh, my name is Michael Peck from One Worker, One Vote. What we have in, in common is Mondragon inspiration and involvement in common efforts to build stronger collaborative bridges between our organizations, which is something that we seem to be doing every single day. Uh, we um, are dedicated to the union co-op model and we are learning so much from each other, as you will see when you hear the presentations. The format today is 40 minutes of individual presentations by our seven speakers, where they will introduce themselves, followed by 14 minutes of closing statements each, a short back and forth, and a conclusion. And now with great pleasure, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah. Thanks, Michael. Um, it's such a privilege to join you today to talk a little bit about why my union, the Baker's Food and Allied Workers Union supports worker co-ops. Um, we represent workers throughout the, the food industry and I'm, I'm very proud to be the General Secretary. Um, we've had a long-term informal recognition agreement with Sumer Whole Foods, which is um, a worker cooperative based in Halifax in Yorkshire over here in the UK that has expanded in recent years and now as a distribution hub um, as well in London. And, and we've had this informal verbal kind of gentleman's agreement for over 20 years, probably nearer to 30, if I'm totally honest. But this year, thanks to the hard work and the determination of the reps in our branch there, we finally managed to get a formal written agreement signed on paper which is absolutely fantastic because it ensures that members of the union and the co-op can work together going forwards with a clear understanding of each other's roles. And personally, I've, I've really learned a lot from working with the reps at SUMA about how a cooperative works. My background's working for Greg's, which is a very different structure. It's a PLC and it, it's nothing like a, a worker cooperative. And, and comparing SUMA with other sites I, I've looked after as an official, there's such a different atmosphere. Um, an organisation where everyone's treated equally, jobs and roles are shared out and rotated whilst recognising and utilising people's skill sets just makes in general a workforce that feels appreciated and, and recognised for the work that they do. That isn't to say it isn't without its problems and there are times where frustrations occur, especially when things are changing. But as a group of members, they are by far our highest paid. And, and the fact that they have the power collectively to decide what to do with the profits of the business, how much to invest back into it and how much to share between them, puts them a world apart from other members who are beholden to shareholders and CEOs. And, and one definitely one of the perks um, as a visitor to, to, to the cooperative um, in Ellens in Halifax is that they made a decision a number of years ago that they would provide three hot meals a day um, for free and that even visitors could have them. So, you know, I, I always enjoy going across to Suma. Um, and, and one of our newer branches is a, is a small pub in London, the Ivy House, and, and that was founded in its current cooperative form in 2013 after the building was saved by residents and locals from it being demolished. Now, I have to admit, I don't know much about the pub itself, with it being based down in London and me being up in Yorkshire. Um, it was a very different region to the one that I worked in before becoming a general secretary. But I know we've got a group of really passionate activists down there that are really working to, to draw the... Um, kind of the ethos of the cooperative movement and the trade union movement and bringing them together. And the, the, the full-time officials down there, like I learned from SUMA, have definitely learned how different things can be for workers when they are part of the decision-making process and not just subjected to changes made by people not affected directly by them. And we're also now talking to a few community-based cafes in the Sheffield area in, in South Yorkshire around working towards recognition too. And, and we'll continue to build on our cooperative branches, offering our support and knowledge around trade unions, employment law, representation and education and, and, and such, but also learning from the worker cooperatives we meet and, and developing the model, if you like, as we progress, because as a union, we believe that worker cooperatives offer a fantastic opportunity for workers 
to retain the skills that they have and utilise them in a workplace structure that is better paid, more secure, where workers are fully engaged in the decision making process and who receive a fair share of the profits on the back of their hard work. And we know going forward in the food industry that it's going to continue to change as we look to become greener and more automated. And we know that there will be opportunities for our members to move out of the workplaces where they are currently in. And it would be great to support them in opening up their own worker co-ops so we don't lose their skills from the industry, but keep them within it and reshape the industry for the better of workers rather than the private businesses that currently dominate it. We know that that'll take time and a lot of empowering workers and giving them some confidence because under normal circumstances, they'd probably just take the redundancy payment and move out of the industry or, you know, take a gap year or or whatever they they may choose. But we want them to know that that's not the... that, that. that that route isn't the only option, that they can can create their own business by by clubbing together. And I know that's a very simplistic view of things, but wouldn't it be fantastic to see those workers continue in our industry using the skills and knowledge that they've built up for years to make a business in which they are the driving force and reap the rewards for their hard work? And obviously, we're not experts in setting up worker cooperatives as a trade union, but I know that working with Union Co-ops UK learning from them and and, and helping and supporting each other, we can change the narrative in our industry and offer a different future to workers together. So thank you again for the invitation um, to speak this evening. I hope that was helpful um, and I'll obviously come back in, in a little while. You're on mute, Michael. Okay, shall I go next? Um, my name is uh, is Alex Bird. Um, in introducing myself, it's hard to know where to start. Um, I've had a very diverse career, although for over half of it, I've earned my living through work at co-ops. I started work as a power station engineer, and I find I'm usually the only person in the room who's worked inside a nuclear reactor. But my career has also included local economic development, a few years as a charity chief exec, and finishing up as a co-op business advisor, activist, researcher, again, in a worker co-op. Going back over my career brought back memories of my first summer holiday job in a timber mill in the early 1960s. You always knew when finished timber was being sawn as you could hear the bullets in the timber being cut. The World War II fighting in the forest was so intense, there were bullets in almost every tree. As yesterday was Veterans Day, I was also reminded of the grandfather I never knew, who died in the Christmas push in 1915. I've campaigned against war all my life, but we must never forget those who gave their lives in whatever conflict, on whatever side they're on. Anyway, I got into co-ops through radical community newspaper publishing. And the first co-op that I co-founded in the early 70s was a print co-op, which grew up over 20 years to become the largest left-wing print shop in Wales with unions and the labour movement, our main customers. Like most print co-ops in the UK, we were a union-based closed shop with everyone on the national agreement terms and conditions and proud of it. Uh, We always put that in in any of our publicity material. Today, you'd call us a union co-op. We predated any form of co-op development support. So recognising that need, I've also been involved since then in running a number of co-op development organisations often ended up as chair or vice chair, and I'm currently chair of a regional co-op bank in development, which we hope will be the first genuine co-op bank in the UK. For me, the union co-ops are partly the result of my personal experience in worker co-ops, but also from a study visit I led to Mondragon in April 2012, taking along, incidentally, a Welsh Senate member, Mark Drakeford, who's now ended up as the first minister of Wales, and is still an enthusiastic advocate for co-ops. Mondragon was an inspiration, particularly as it's all about engineering, and I trained as an engineer. Um, Engineers have a different way of looking at the world, always taking things apart mentally to understand how they work and how to repair them. Mondragon, of course, came not so much from ideology, but a simple recognition in 1956 by the local priest that a fascist government in Madrid was never going to help the Basques 
so they had to do it themselves. So they dismantled the local economy in their minds, worked out how to repair it. First through education, setting up an apprentice school, then by rehoming their own money in their own bank, and then through setting up worker co-ops engaged in manufacturing. Today, it's the largest worker co-op group in the world and it completely dominates the local economy. When we returned from Spain, I put together a series of presentations which I gave to the Co-op Party Congress in Cardiff in June 2012, um, the Co-ops UK Congress in Manchester in June 2013. And, and that was great fun because I had the Mondragon delegation sitting at the back in my workshop. So I had to make sure I got everything right. And again at Utland in Preston in September the same year. And, and that and other connections have led to worker co-ops being at the heart of the Preston model. And Andrew and Julian will explain a lot more about that shortly. Unions and co-ops go back a long way, of course. Both come from the same radical roots. And many of the activists that created them were the same, including Robert Owen, one of the fathers of cooperation who formed the Grand National Consolidated Trade Union in 1834, actively supported the toll puddle martyrs in their fight against deportation and the Chartists fighting for rights and representation for working people. It's also only in the last few years that I've learned about um, an organization called the Knights of Labor, which operated in the USA from 1869 to 1890 with a membership of up to 800,000 at one point. They helped create 334 worker co-ops between 1880 and 1888, often as part of their struggles against their employers. Labor unions, representative democracy, universal suffrage and the co-op movement all come from the same radical roots. But the co-op movement and the unions have drifted apart for many years now. The union co-op movement is working to bring co-ops and unions back together again to work in partnership, to create decent work with democracy in the workplace, no outside owners and union terms and conditions. Union Co-ops UK, of which I'm a founder member, is the lead body for union co-ops here in the UK. And we're a relatively new organization of trade unionists and cooperators working to bring the two sides of the UK labor movement back together again. We run on a shoestring budget and are grateful to our sponsors, the Bakers Union, BFAWU, the Musicians Union and Cooperative Ways Forward. who are all sponsoring our upcoming conference at Wortley Hall on May the 20th, 21st next year, as well as our ongoing series of online events. If you're able to make any of those, the online events or even the in-person conference, you'll all be made very welcome. Thank you. Alex, you turn it over to your next colleague. Uh, and who's coming up next? It's Julian. It's Julian. Okay, um, Julian, I'll I hand over say... to you now and you can tell us more about um, everything that you're doing in Preston. Thanks. Thank you. If I could have the slides up, please. So my name's Julian Manley. Um, I'm a founder member of the Preston Cooperative Development Network and a founder member of the Preston Cooperative Education Centre. Um, and I'm also the coordinator of the, um, the project committee for the Preston Cooperative Entrepreneurial Ecosystem Design. Um, and I've been working in Preston in the design of the Preston model uh, since 2012-2013. Uh, I have a long um, connection with uh, Mondragon dating from uh, a way back before 2013 and um, one of the things I try to do in Preston is to uh, bring in the Mondragon experience into the uh, Preston model. So what I'm going to talk to you about uh, today is um, the founding of the Preston Cooperative Education Centre um, as a union co-op. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So, um, what became very clear to us in Preston when we invited Mikhail Lethamith uh, to visit us at the University of Central Lancashire in Preston uh, at uh, various public events, what became clear to us was that uh, education is absolutely central to the Mondragon experience. So the Mondragon experience began with 13 years of technical college and education in order to try and um, 
bring new skills uh, into the workplace and in order to encourage uh, the work with cooperative principles and values and that was the beginnings of uh, the Mondragon experience um, and even today the um, the way Mondragon works is with uh, a lot of education and training um, all the time it's regarded as uh, central to um, to the experience and um, I don't know if you can see the slide there with uh, Father Jose Maria Arizmendi Areta, the founder of Mondragon, uh, making a comment there about the value of education, um, saying that uh, the cooperative movement could be viewed as, um, as uh, education as much as uh, an economic uh, movement. So ever since um, 2013, we've had several uh, visits uh, from Mondragon um, the latest one was in fact last week, um, which is uh, displayed there on the screen. Um, and um, since then, we've been developing um, not only with uh, visits uh, to Mondragon and visits from Mondragon to Preston, but also with um, consultancy and training from the LKS Mondragon group um, to help us develop uh, the ecosystem. If I could have the next slide, please. So we're in the process of developing uh, partnerships with Mondragon in the uh, area of education and training. And um, since in Mondragon it is such an important uh, aspect of what they do, um, there are different ways of approaching education and we're learning a lot about those different ways. And the Preston Cooperative Education Centre is certainly going to be work working in this fashion uh, and what it means is providing an education and training which has a broad and inclusive and diverse range of possibilities uh, ranging from the pragmatic and practical skills-based training uh, all the way to higher education and um, the application of new ideas and the application of cooperative values and principles uh, to leadership and management um, in Mondragon, for example, we have uh, Otalora, which is the management training centre for the cooperatives within Mondragon. We have, of course, Mondragon University, the only truly cooperative university in the world. Uh, and we had a visit from uh, an academic from Mondragon University last week to Preston, uh, who is the designer of a degree course in cooperative leadership and management. And that cooperative degree uh, in leadership and management has been taken to the city of Bilbao and um, is brought into um, a collaboration with the Bilbao City Council uh, in a new uh, teaching and learning organization called the, um, the BBF. Um, and um, furthermore, the, that part of the uh, education is supported by um, Gast Impressa, which is the um, the section of the Liberal Kucha Bank that uh, provides uh, mentoring and uh, training and support for business plans and the creation of new cooperative businesses um, for um, Mondragon and indeed for the Basque region. Uh, in general. So what we have in Mondragon, what we learn from Mondragon is we have a diverse range of different teaching and learning centres, um, which this is which is precisely what we want to do uh, in Preston with the Preston Cooperative Education Centre. The difference in Preston and the difference which is uh, why we're speaking here in this particular session, the difference is that we're creating the um, the Preston Cooperative Education Centre as a union co-op. Um, whereas, of course, in, in Mondragon itself, um, the the aspect of the, the, the unions is taken uh, by what they call the social council. So that's an essential difference based on cultural differences. If I could have the next slide, please. So um, we're very much taking on board this fantastic um, motto that uh, defines Mondragon, humanity at work. And um, we, we're building relationships with um, people as well as with uh, organizations. 
with uh, Aito from Underground University who came last, uh, last week to talk to us about the uh, combination of an academic teaching in uh, leadership and cooperative management and how that can be combined with practical work experience so that the academic teaching becomes a reality in work experience and people who take that degree course go on to create new startup businesses many of which are cooperatives so combining the academic and the thinking and the conceptual with the practical developments on the ground is uh, another feature of Mondragon where in they're very pragmatic and practical in Mondragon and they're able to combine uh, theory and practice in a way which I think is really uh, fundamental to their success. Um, Oscar, uh, the head of um, business banking in La Rocuche, is also an expert in guest Presser, as I mentioned before, the social uh, mentoring um, department of La Rocuche, the Mondragon Bank. Uh, John Altuna, the vice rector of Mondragon University, um, has supported uh, the Cooperative College, with whom the uh, Preston Cooperative Education Centre has uh, um, a very uh, significant um, collaboration and in fact there's a memorandum of understanding between Mondragon University and the Cooperative College which brings the the two institutions together and brings both of those closer to the Preston Cooperative Education Centre. Uh, Yolanda Lecuona is the director of Otelora, the uh, training centre in Mondragon and uh, Ivan Zugasti and Marta Boicheras are two of the uh, experts in uh, the Mondragon ecosystem who've been visiting Preston and giving us advice on developing the Preston ecosystem. If I could have the next slide, please. So the Preston Cooperative of Education Centre, the PCEC, uh, is a union cooperative. I believe it's the first uh, union cooperative in the UK. Uh, it's only just been founded, so uh, we're still in the development, curriculum development and developing a business plan. But uh, we have a, a very dedicated and enthusiastic and committed group of directors. Um, and we have great hopes for uh, developing a, a teaching and learning system which uh, is based as much on experience as on uh, theory. So we're, we're talking about a different way of teaching and learning as well. And part of that teaching and learning, of course, is the lived experience of working in a democratic, a democratic system of a, a union co-op. And the students will um, have uh, a say as members of the co-op uh, as much as the uh, members of staff and the, uh, in how to govern the uh, cooperative. So the uh, cooperative will be um, work, working in experience as well as in, in uh, teaching. Um, so we're interested, of course, in the ultimate aim of the uh, education centre is to create uh, actual businesses. And so we're interested in combining uh, the centre with the ecosystem in uh, Preston, uh, with the Preston Cooperative Development Network and also with the uh, business incubation hub at the University of Central Lancashire. Um, so it's very important to understand that we have, just as in Manugon, a practical aspect to that as well. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, obviously, we're a fledgling organisation and there are uh, issues to uh, discuss. Um, and to think about and to overcome. Uh, the first of these is uh, awareness. Uh, many people in Preston are not very uh, aware of what uh, cooperative uh, working is. Um, there we People even in trade unions are not necessarily aware uh, or, or not necessarily in favour of uh, cooperative working. So. Um, part of our work is to uh, make uh, people aware of what's going on. Um, it's a culture that we have to change. We have to change the way people think about uh, business and about teaching and learning. 
um, moving away from a neoliberal paradigm of competition and individualism to uh, a different way of working, which fits in with the 21st century, working towards uh, a, a post-COP26 and a post-pandemic society. Um, and of course, there's always the problem of funding. Uh, unlike the United States, it's very difficult in the uh, United Kingdom to um, to find patrons and sponsors. So within our business plan, we have to include um, a, the making the present and Cooperative Education Centre as a viable business in itself. So it's possible to look for some funding, which of course we're, we're looking to, to find, but ultimately the ultimate aim of the centre is to to work uh, auto as an autonomous business and to make sure that, that happens for the benefit of um, people in Preston and beyond. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julian. Our next speaker is... Simon and myself. Yes, and then Anita. Yeah, thank you very much, Julian, and thank you, Michael. Um, so um, I think if we can have our slides up, please. Um, firstly, many thanks to our counterparts in the States for participating our, in our own recent online event. I thought they were absolutely awesome. Um, and for their reciprocal invitation, asking us to participate here today. My name is Simon Taylor, and I'm a trade unionist here in the UK, employed by a large local authority. Um, and I have a substantive post working in adult social care. Uh, I am full time seconded to my trade union branch, representing our members um, delivering public services. And those public services uh, are many and varied. They, they include um, social care, adult and children's social care, um, many education settings such as schools and colleges, um, environment and transport and libraries and so on. Primarily, um, this is in the public sector, but we also have many members employed by private sector um, companies. Both myself and my co-presenter on this session, Mick McEwen, are in the same union, which is Unison. My interest in unionised worker cooperatives stems from uh, some six years ago or so when I wrote my master's dissertation. And I had the privilege of interviewing people like Michael Peck and others in the States as part of my um, dissertation research. And I, I always say thank you to Michael, and, and I say again, thank you, Michael. It thank was, you, it was, it was immense. Um, I was interested in developments in the States, beginning with the efforts of the United Steelworkers and their collaboration with Mondragon. Um, and that's because my academic studies um, focused on, on the twin themes of trade union crisis and renewal. Um, and union co-ops, unionised worker cooperatives, appeared to me to address many of the core problems associated with that decline. Uh, problems such as poor wages and conditions and, and, and worker alienation. As such, to me, union co-ops represented a potential tool of um, trade union renewal and organising. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Mick now to follow on with his introduction and then we'll, we'll come to slide two after, after Mick's finished. Okay, thanks Simon. I, I, I'm Mick McKeown. I, like, like Simon said, I'm a long time activist in Unison, the public sector union. I came into that through working as a mental health nurse in the national, our national health service. And latterly I work doing uh, academic job in the university with, with Julian, who you've already heard from, teaching nurses and, and doing research and getting involved in the Preston model of, of, of community wealth building. So back to you, Simon. Thanks, Mick. So if we can, if I can't quite see the slide clearly, if we're on, are we on the second one for us? Okay. Um, Mick and I believe that the union co-op model is of particular interest to us as unison activists uh, in the realm of delivering social care, primarily in adult provision, which here in the UK is largely delivered by the private sector, um, such as in residential care homes or in people's own homes. This is different to 
health services, um, such as those delivered in hospitals, doctors' surgeries, clinics, etc., which are predominantly delivered by the public sector in the form of our National Health Service. Though that principle has been eroded, to be fair, and undermined by our current government and um, the actions of its predecessors, so our National Health Service it has become increasingly privatised and, and comes under increasing pressure. For our union, Unison, public ownership and the NHS is sacrosanct. And we, we, we do not propose advocating for union co-ops within healthcare settings. But our experience shows that private sector social care employers are often hyper exploitative, offering low wages and poor conditions. And this is an area that we believe union co-ops have much to offer workers and unions. Unison is the largest union in, in the UK and its primary focus is on representing workers employed delivering public services. There are other large unions representing public service workers, but they also have substantial private sector industrial bases. Or they may represent specific discrete groups of workers, particularly in the health sector. Where we are today in terms of public services should be considered in the context in the UK of over 40 years of neoliberalised efforts to convert public money in the form of taxation into private profit via privatisation and outsourcing. And actively seeking to marginalise trade unions who are identified as a primary barrier to laissez-faire. Although unions in the UK remain significant organisations, Nonetheless, their influence and effectiveness has been significantly eroded in this era. They have employed a number of tactics in response to the neoliberal assault and the decline in membership has largely hit the bottom of the trough. We seemingly struggle, though, in general, to climb the peak of consciousness in the eyes of many workers and of the public and of the wider public. Nor again anything like the industrial strength um, previously attained in the 1960s and 70s. So we propose that union co-ops and the principles underpinning them can demonstrate to workers that there is a viable alternative to the status quo. Uh, can we move on to the next slide? Are we there? Thank you. Okay, although the cooperative movement was founded along with trade unions in the UK as part of the response by workers and ordinary people to the privations visited upon them by our industrial revolution. Unfortunately, both moments, both movements seem to develop historically on related but separate paths. This has led to a historical lack of awareness of each other, verging on a mutual distrust in some cases. As my colleague Alex stated earlier, part of our work as Union Corps UK is getting certain key elements in both movements to engage in constructive dialogue and promote positive actions to develop the Union Co-op model. I spoke earlier about the tensions within our own union regarding the ownership and control of public services. It argues passionately in favour of insourcing public services back into the public sector. And as a principle, there is much to be admired in that. But the reality of our situation is that there is little sign that insourcing is going to be anything other than marginal. And would arguably be offset or undermined by further efforts to privatise and outsource other services. With that in mind, we argue that unions must adopt a pragmatic approach, acknowledging the situation as it is, and adopt innovative approaches such as the union co-op model in response. We believe that organising strategies in UK unions to date have been primarily focused on existing employers and groups of workers sitting within the mainstream economic paradigm. Now, while these strategies have had some positive impacts, we believe nonetheless that our unions could and should divert, divert some of their organising resources 
into the creation of union co-ops. You in the States are our inspiration, particularly the way your union co-ops are embedded intrinsically in your communities. And we think our communities overall will benefit from developing union co-ops in the UK. I'm going to hand over now to Mick. Okay, th thanks, Simon. So, yeah, stay on that slide. So, so one of the, um, the if you like, the, the, the battlegrounds that, that we have and we will have to come it is framed around the social care sector in the UK, which, as Simon has said, is, is for the unions a site of action to try and incorporate um, social care provision back into the state. And the unions have an ambition for a national care service to parallel the national health service but as simon has said as well you know even though we'd be fond of that if it happened the it's not necessarily a realistic ambition for for the unions at the moment and even if we could get a national care service what form would it take so we think that the idea of sort of worker democracy within this sector which is crying out for it because it's been more or less turned into an economic basket case by the financialized debt laden model built upon waves of deregulation and privatization that exists currently. This sector exists, you know, it's ripe for um, cooperative developments. And those cooperative developments could also be a beacon for industrial democracy elsewhere within the wider public sector. We also believe, as Simon has sort of led us into, is that organizing around social care could be a real boon to unions that are having to struggle just to stand still in terms of membership and unison is one of the few unions in the country over the last five years that has actually grown slightly in membership but that has been a growth you know in the face of large membership losses so large recruitment has had to happen just to barely stand still and create sort of marginal gains but last year the trajectory was was net losses in membership there is some promise here in that we spent a long time in the northwest of england helped along by the existence of these new municipal approaches to fairer economies like the preston model to persuade our union comrades and union leadership that co-op they have nothing to fear from cooperatives worker cooperatives and particularly union cooperatives as a model for change in this sector but believe us that hasn't necessarily been an easy set of conversations but we think we've made a lot of progress and alongside this is the union can see that organizing in this sector is relevant and is absolutely essential because union density is low to start with and has enacted a number of campaigns nationally there's been a campaign around an ethical care charter and locally, but there's been a Care Workers for Change organising campaign in our region. We're now in a position where we have the leadership of our union in the region committed to this. And we've got lots of other allies, including CLES, who are a sort of economic strategy think tank, local carers groups. We've had lots of liaison has been pointed out with Mondragon and Onthe, who are a large disability employer in Spain. And we've had the support uh, of... Um, people within groups like the Open Society Foundation and significantly uh, support and liaison with our sister union, SEIU HW, who have made already made progress in terms of union sponsored care co-ops in the states where, where you are. So can I have the, oh yeah, the, the, we've got this slide up now. So, so the unions have, have come together in the UK to get behind you, but not, you know, not necessarily fully, but a, a bunch of us in unions are behind this idea of union co-ops, inspired, as we've said, for people like Michael Peck and yourselves and Mondragon. And Julian has told us already about the Preston Cooperative Education Centre, so I'm not going to dwell on that. I've hinted that we're gaining traction in a, in a campaign or let's call it a movement to develop a care sector cooperative as, as a union co-op in Preston. 
there are other models in the UK that aren't necessarily union co-ops, but are cooperatively organised in the care sector. And I want to tell you a little bit about a prisoner, ex-prisoner cooperative that we're in the process of developing uh, in the uh, criminal justice system in and around Preston as well. So the, the local, uh, the, the financial organisations that commission these sorts of services have already put a significant investment into developing the ideas for these co-ops and we're well on the way to, to launching them as um, constituted um, cooperatives. Um, the first one is in a place called Edith, Edith Rigby House, which is a sort of approved premises for women coming out of prison. So it's a sort of step down facility that's, that's a residential um, place that has staff on the premises. And the idea there that, that the, the co-op that the women themselves have come up with as an idea is a sort of sales co-op that, that sells goods that have been creatively made by the cooperative members. And these, these involve things like calendars, books, cards, and clothing like t-shirts and hoodies that are, that are screen printed. The Goop is a through the prison gate co-op. So it's it's a co-op that would exist behind, the, uh, behind, behind the doors of the prison and through the doors out into the community. And Goop is an already established initiative within the prison sector that's called um, Greener on the Outside for, for Prisons, and it's a horticulture initiative. So this exists anyway, but it doesn't exist as a cooperative. So the plan here is to convert some of this goop work that's about you know growing food particularly into a, a saleable business as a, as a cooperative. And the last one is called the Build a Life Co-op, which is a construction co-op that would originally be framed <coughs> around the refurbishment of homes that are unfit for habitation and would have a twofold aim. It would both create this sort of transition on employment for prisoners and ex-prisoners, but also create the accommodation that these groups often struggle to secure for themselves once, once they come out of prison. And I think these initiatives are really interesting because they, for those of you who've been on the conference from the start, they connect with some of the sort of values-led practice and reparative justice ideas that, that the people in the earlier um, conversation were linking to cooperative endeavours. And I think, should these be successful, they're crucially important in terms of both, you know, providing employment for groups who are typically excluded from the labour market, but also in that sense, affecting their sort of positive sense of identity and self as well, which ought to be productive in terms of tackling some of the reasons why people ended up in, in prison in the first place. So taken together, this commitment to sort of critical education, cooperative education, developing ideas in the care sector that is really needed, and these ideas around prisoner and ex-prisoner cooperative, we think these are part of making, you know, without getting too overblown with it, they're they're about making the, the local economy more just and fair, but they also might be able to show us how we might begin to frame society more around ideals and values of care rather than competition and conflict. So I'd like to hand over now to Anita, who's going to bring everything together at the end. Great. Thanks very much. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Anita Mangan. I'm also a founding member of Co-ops UK, a union Co-ops UK. Um, I'm also a academic in the University of Bristol, and I'm a member of the University and Colleges Union there. So um, my research is all about cooperatives, union cooperatives and credit unions. But what I want to talk about for the next few slides, and if you could put on to the next slide, please, Angelica. Um, what I want to talk about is the the value of global collaboration, because from all of our speakers this evening, you've heard about the fantastic and inspiring international links. And, you know, to, to, to just give you a sense of how much we value these international links. Um, when we were writing the manifesto for decent work uh, for Union Co-ops UK, we were very inspired by one worker, one vote, and um, obviously very honored to have Michael on the call with us today. But then, of course, when you take one step back, as everybody has already mentioned, 
Um, one Worker, One Vote developed from an international collaboration with United Steel Workers in Mondragon. And then as Alex and Julian have both explained to you, there have been constant international links going back a long time between um, UK delegates from Wales and from Preston with Mondragon as well. So as you've heard already this evening, there's ongoing fruitful relationships on many levels and lots of exciting uh, collaborations and results coming out from it. And, you know, to, to, to explain it to you, uh, it, it's worth quoting Michael Peck again, where he said, a prophet isn't recognized in his own country. He's very fond of um, quoting that one. But really, I wanted to highlight the fact that the international recognition, the international encouragement and solidarity means an awful lot to us all on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, you know, we get fierce consolation and encouragement and excitement seeing what's happening in the States. And then equally, we find that uh, the conversations we have with our colleagues in the States inspire us to greater things. So the next slide, please, Angelica. Just to give you a sense of some of the, um, the transatlantic solidarity that's been happening over the last 18 months, really. So we had uh, Michael speaking at our manifesto launch on the 2nd of July, 2020. And we followed up that last month with a union co-op stateside women, webinar where the, um, the speakers explained the US experience to participants in the UK and it generated a huge amount of excitement and a sense of we can do this, you know, we're far, far behind the US uh, colleagues in terms of uh, setting up union co-ops. But really from listening to Michael, Ray Crisitello from Union Healthcare Workers West, from Kristen Baker and Ellen Vera and Co-op Cincy and Kevin O'Brien from Works Printing, we really got a sense of what is possible to do with the union co-op model. Of course, last week there was the Preston Meets Mondragon uh, two seminar series that Julian spoke about. And here we are tonight at the Union Co-op Symposium. So we've already established a really nice uh, transatlantic link of solidarity between all of our activists. And the next slide, please, Angelica. So this is really to, to sum up all the conversations we've been having thus far this evening, to say that really, these are valued friendships. These are valued experiences and expertise that we can share around the world. And the questions are really, how can we do more of the same? How can we develop and nurture these existing bonds? And I have no answers for this. I'm really keen to hear what everybody can say and, and to take all the suggestions for the future. You know, should we have a regular international seminar series where we can share ideas, best practice, and just encourage each other along? Could we jointly develop educational materials? I think, you know, education has been one of the threads throughout all of the presentations this evening. Could we actually do some media campaigns? So in the uh, U US uh, Union Co-op Stateside webinar last month, we were talking about the, the actual invisibility of unions, co-ops and union co-ops in the mainstream media and how we might actually counter that. And then the academic in me wants to know, well, what could we do extra in terms of research, whether it's edited collections, uh, whether it's special issues in journals, so we're very keen to hear what ideas you might have as well. And if we could have the next slide, please, Angelica. And so this is um, our website address and our Twitter handle. That's a whistle-stop tour really through the importance of the international relationship to, to actually say thank you to all our, our US and Mondragon colleagues for the inspiration they give us because as, as um, Simon has been saying, we're just starting out and we have much to learn and much encouragement to take from the fine models that have gone ahead of us. So I'll pass back now to Michael. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Anita. Um, and we have, uh, we have about 10 minutes and I'd like uh, for all of you to feel free just to have a loose, you know, back and forth conversation. But let me just first say that the compliments that you've sent to our ways are deeply appreciated, but but truly, we are learning more from you. 
Um, for example, Julian is teaching me how to write again. Um, and, uh, you know, listening to Anita speak, um, uh, obviously, every time she speaks, I take notes. And every Thursday at five o'clock in the morning, Mick, you know, helps me um, direct my way towards thinking. And I could go say that about Alex and just really everybody on this panel. So it's such a two way street. Uh, it's a total two way street. It's a two way highway. So with, with that being said, let me turn it back to all of you to have a conversation among yourselves and ourselves about how you think we should close out the panel. Alex, would you like to start? Yeah, I think one thing that, that's really important that's popped up in the chat, but we haven't spoken about it at all, really, is, is the actual the role of a trade union within a union co-op. Because clearly, from the trade union's point of view, it's great to have you know proper employed pro processes, agreements, etc. And, and as Sarah said, you know the people at Sumo are far and away the best paid people anywhere in her union. So you know that's important. But for the union co-op itself, it's really important the way the union interacts. And 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 I think of it as as to, as having two heads. You know, when you're in a worker co-op, you're you're running a business, but you're also an employee. And you're the employee of the of the collective that includes you. So it's it's quite possible, and I've seen it happen on odd occasions, where um, the workers in a, in a worker co-op can start to self-exploit themselves. Going gets tough. They start cutting their terms and conditions, working harder for less pay. And one of the things that the union does, particularly where it's been put in the structure that, that you at One Worker, One Vote have developed of the, of the three um, sort of power groupings within the governance system, which is based on Mondragon's three groupings within the within the governance system, which is that you know the the, the 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 way the board of directors runs, the way that relates to the to the management team and the workforce, and the way then that you have a separate social committee or union committee that that deals with how people are employed, and I think that's the really key, crucial role that the unions play within a union co-op. They help the, the, the workforce to put on the different hats at different times and think in different ways about their relationship with the cooperative business. So that on one occasion, they're thinking about how to make it profitable, expand its business, whatever. And on other occasions, they're sitting there thinking about how, how do we relate to ourselves as employees, terms and conditions, etc. So I think that's a really crucial element and one that we haven't spoken about. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. Anybody else would like to comment? Yeah, yes, Sarah. I think the biggest learning curve for me was, um, you, you, so today, for example, I've been in wage negotiations with Greg's all day, you know, sitting and negotiating with an employer and trying to push for more and, and thinking about the membership. It's a very different dynamic in a worker co-op. Um, where that kind of part of my role as a union official was almost redundant because that's what the members of the co-op are there for rather than the union. We would be there to say to them, we think you could push a bit more as a group, but not to have those direct negotiations. So that was a massive learning curve for me at SUMA, um, the different dynamic of the need for the union. But Alex is right, being there to say, you know, don't be getting rid of those paid breaks because you deserve them and, and making sure that you keep into the working time directive and having all the benefits of, of being the worker led organization. Um, that, yeah, that, that's really important, but just that slight different dynamic really threw me when I started working with Suma, but now I quite enjoy watching them thrive as a group of members. It, it's really, yeah, it's interesting. That's great. Um, yes, Mick. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to say as someone who's, who's been in, in the UK labour movement in, in just, you know, one union, really, for like like nearly 40 years, I often ask the question, what's the point of, of trade unions, even though I'm heavily active in them? And I think that's a question that a lot of the general public have asked and answered and decided there is no point, you know, and our battle to, to re-energise and renew the unions is, is to get over that. And I think, you know, one of the things that people have pointed out is the unions over the last few decades became more servicing organisations like private insurance. And they lost that sense of being solidarity organisations that are embedded in communities and interested in community issues beyond the workplace. So I really do think 
And I've never been so excited to be a union activist as now <laughs> that, that this union co-op model is our right royal road to redemption for all of those problems. Because the ultimate goal of union organising has to be workers in control of their own workplaces. Yes. And I think the labour movement lost sight of that. Right. And this is the way to, to get it back. It really is. And yes. I, we just need to persuade more people that that's the road that we're on. Yes. Yes, and absolutely. Anita. Yes, um, I want to go back to something that Alex said at the very start, that the labour and uh, cooperative movements have a long history going back to the 19th century. And I think part of the challenge for us is reminding unions and cooperators of those previous links that, you know, we're not enemies that we can actually work collaboratively and successfully together. So it's about persuading um, union members that co-ops aren't evil. <laughs> and in contrast, uh, persuading the cooperators that there are lots of benefits to be involved in, in, in a trade union. And that's before you even start at the wider public and telling them about both movements. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of ignorance to get over and get, get beyond. Yes. Yes. Simon, did you want to say something? Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Um, doing, being involved in something like this, it, it, it takes me back to um, an argument that I put forward in my in my dissertation those years ago. Um, obviously, I've spoken today about the potential um, for a large union like Unison in, in, in terms of particularly social care, uh, delivery of social care in the private sector. Uh, and you know that, that that there's massive potential there, and I think it could be massively beneficial um, in a decade, two decades' time, if 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 the union, if we can get it into the position of getting on board with the, the kind of agenda that, that people like Mick and myself are advocating for. But going back to my dissertation, it, rem it reminded me that, that that conversely, it's it's unions like Sarah's, the Bakers' unions, who who may well be better placed at this point in time to do something positive and take the union co-op concept forward because they're they're, they're leaner more agile um and certainly with the bakers um it, it, it's um a hundred percent private sector sarah am i correct um you know you're used to be, being innovative and, and 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 coming up with new ways of getting around a problem um so it just reminded me participating today uh, of that point I made in the dissertation, the argument that I made, um, and and I, I, it's it's just so welcome that Sarah and her union have, have give us their backing uh, and support um, on a Friday night. We've all had a long we've all had a long week. Sarah's been battling with a, a big yeah. employer all day today. Yeah. Fantastic, Sarah. Thank you very much for for, for your efforts today, and I, I hope we. we we, we are getting something going here um, collectively. Thanks, Michael. Thank, thank you all very much. Um, Julian, uh, would, you, would you like to say something before we conclude? Well, I'd just like to say that I think it's a very exciting movement that we have and that each place, we talk about USA, uh, Mondragon, Preston, uh, each place can have its lens because uh, we're not talking about a template. What we're talking about is solidarity and mutual support. And that is what combines uh, trade unionism with cooperatives, solidarity and mutual support. And, and it's trying to make people understand that there isn't a conflict between uh, unions and cooperatives because unions and cooperatives are all about um, solidarity and it's solidarity that binds us to the United States and to the fantastic work that you do Michael and uh, whatever you say we admire you greatly thank you very much oh okay so listen I, I think my cup is running over uh, and my wife will not allow me back in the house um, with all these great things but please allow me to thank you so much and you're so welcome to stay with us Although, if you want to go and get a pint somewhere um, um, in, in, in that three-letter world called pub or just go home and call it a day, you are totally welcome to do so. Thank you so much, and may the learning journey continue. And we have big feelings for you here in the U.S. and very grateful for this session and, and for our relationship. So thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.
people, are we meant to go into another room now, or or what, what's the plan? I thought Michael was going to stay and tell us what was happening. There's another session on union co-ops, isn't there? Yeah, I think we're meant it's to a panel. join it, aren't we? <laughs> is it immediately, or is it a, bit, is it a little break? Did someone mention a pint? <laughs> <laughs> I have a I feeling it's on. About five or ten minute break, isn't it now? And, and then the second Yeah, session. I think it's starting again at 25 to. Yeah. And I'm not sure what our role is. I mean, they, they, they asked us to be in that, but we are just audience, as I understand it. So I'm, I'm I'm not sure if Sarah was briefed in in on this, and, I, and I'm a little unclear unclear myself. Um, so, if if Sarah wants to duck out now, that would be entirely understandable. And and on behalf of, of everyone, thank you very much for rocking up today. It's been fantastic. No, yeah, it's thank amazing. You. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. I, I believe you're going to be helping us out with the education centre as well, Sarah, and the campaign around that. Yeah, I think Ian and Andy have had a conversation about that. I've not been fully briefed yet, but definitely. Um, yeah. And you know, I do. I'm, I'm not a I'm, I'm not a trained teacher or anything like that, but I have done train the trainers courses. So if I can help in that yeah. way and, and offer my services at any point, you know, to run Sarah, that's fantastic. By all means, give me a it shout. It would be great to. It'd be great to think it through and stitch it together with some union organising, so it's not just education yeah, yeah. on its own. Yeah. Yep, you're right. all are totally welcome to attend the next sessions as participants. Um, but if you want to go home and call it a day, um, you're, you totally have the right to do so. Okay. <laughs> cheers, if I Michael. was in your time zone. That's what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michael. It's been a rough thank week. You so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for Michael. Say, Michael. But we all know that you're up at all times, all hours. In fact, when do you ever go to bed? Yes, well, um, sleep is for the next life. Like <laughs> <laughs> you'll get Michael's you'll not saying he's the Prince life. of Darkness, is he? <laughs> no. <laughs> not for us, it sounds like. No. no, no, no. Listen, it's called, in the Spanish, they call it Deformation professional professional deformity, uh, because first in the navy they didn't let us sleep, and then when I started working with Spain, they were always six hours ahead. So you know, it's just, I got into the habit. Now, now I just can't shake that loving feeling. I don't know how to explain it any other way. We, we trust you, Michael. I can see sunlight coming into your room. So, so the, I think Simon was on the wrong stair there. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. Well, listen. Take care. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe, and we will definitely Cheers. be in touch and you do guys. great things together. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. See you.